Hello, it's Tiana, and I wanted to respond to Nancy's statement from the Discord, which she was asking questions about part three's conversation about obesity and this subject that has lost a huge amount of weight and then gains it back because of uh, what is stated to be um, trauma response to someone having sexual interest in them. And I want to say that this is, this is challenging because uh, number one, this story is, you know, told through the lens of someone who has a lot of dominant identities. And it's also a third, fourth person sort of, sort of story because it's this doctor talking about their patient. And so it's just, it's how much of this information, how many different lenses has it been filtered through before we get the narrative that kind of, that actually shows up in the book. So I do want to talk about very specifically some of Nancy's questions, which were, isn't this reinforcing fat phobia? Is it talking about, you know, are we talking about desirability or, and also like acts of violence slash dominance, like all kinds of things are going on here in this story. So I just want to like speak a little bit more on it because I know I didn't have very much time to discuss it in the live call. So here we go. All right. So I'm looking at my notes right now <laughs> because so much here. All right. So basically we're looking at... Um, uh, page 143, which is part three, and we're talking about, I think the heading is the hidden epidemic. So when I first read that heading and then noticed that they were talking about, you know, quote unquote obesity here, I was, okay, what is the hidden epidemic here? <laughs> is it obesity or is it actually child abuse? Which is sort of what it seems to be talking about, but also considering that fatness is used in this in this place as the the case study and that fatness quote unquote the obesity of epidemic is a thing that is in the discourse right now i just thought that was an interesting little pun <laughs> to be calling it that so there's that but basically the, sh the long and the short of it is this other doctor uh, his name i think is felidi and essentially what he is saying is that he had his client or his patient, he's doing a, a study and he was using what's called supplemented absolute fasting. And I'd never heard that phrase before. And so I went looking for it. And essentially what supplemented absolute fasting is, is that these people are not allowed to eat or drink. So they are 100% starving, you know, nicely called fasting here, but they're starving. They're completely, they're completely restricting their food intake. And it is a supplemented absolute fasting because, you know, these are doctors. They understand that you do need nutrition in order to not die. So these people are able to take supplements, probably in pill form or who knows, but, but either way, they're able to take supplements probably with water and nothing else. And that's the only thing that they're able to have. And I think that that's horrible because, you know, no wonder it causes, um, you know, th what did they say? This great results or something. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to create great results. People are going to lose great amounts of weight when you fucking keep them from eating. Absolutely. We know this and we have seen this time and again, unfortunately, through some really horrible means such as, you know, the Holocaust. And when there's extreme famine, this is a thing that we've seen over and over again. Ethiopia, Somalia, it is what it is. We know that when people don't eat, they lose weight. So I don't really understand why this needs to be studied, but whatever. That's my point of view. So, <laughs> so basically... This woman, this person is on this, uh, on this diet for 51 weeks. 
that's a year. That's basically a year because a year is 52 weeks long. So this person is on a no eating, no drinking diet, starvation diet for almost a whole year. And she had a huge weight loss. Over 200 pounds was lost in this period of time. And I'm <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, you know. So the thing is that the the twist, the surprise, the thing that kicks it all off is that when she comes back for her follow up a couple of months later. So do we know if this is two months or three months? I don't know. It doesn't say it just as a few. She had regained more weight than he thought was biologically possible in such a short time. And that's taken from page 144. And I mean, all of these words, all of these phrases are relative because what is a few months is one question. Also, what did Philly think was biologically possible as far as weight gain is concerned? Because it is hugely possible, completely possible for the human body to gain lots and lots of weight in a short period of time. For example, pregnancy. <laughs> there are people who will, when they are growing a baby inside their body, gain gobs and gobs of weight, partially due to the fact that there's a new growing creature inside, there's a whole new organ that has been created um, to service the new growing creature, you have a doubling of your, of your, um, your blood supply, your, um, you're retaining fluids. Some people experience increased appetite. So it's just, come on now. <laughs> the, the human body is able to gain lots and lots of weight. Um, and also considering that Felidi is a weight loss scientist, what is a lot of weight to him? You know, I, I assume Felidi is probably not a fat person. And... Felidi is somebody who's trying to make fat people thin. Also says to me that he already has some weight bias and is definitely steeped in fat phobia. So a lot of weight to him could be 30 pounds. You know, it could be 50 pounds, who knows? But knowing that this person biologically has just shrunk their body by over 200 pounds, the body doesn't like that sort of thing, just biologically. It's a big deal to the body when you start to lose weight, especially through something like starvation. The body is in panic mode, full on panic mode. And so anything she puts in her mouth is going to go directly to storage because the metabolism, her metabolism was probably severely downgraded during this dieting period. And oh my goodness, the body is freaking out. It's like, oh my God, thank you calories. So, you know, it's not a surprise she gained this weight back because starvation is not sustainable. It's just, it's sort of against how the human body works and how life is sustained. So, so essentially these are all the things that you have to sort of pick apart by the statement that is made here. But, but, huh, okay. So, so that's one part, right? That's one part. That's the biological part. And that's the, the inevitable result of what happens to a human body that has been restricting caloric intake. It will always happen because the body does not like to let go of calories. That's not what the body wants to do. The body wants to survive and it knows it needs calories to survive. So that's the first thing. <sighs> However, they say as part of the narrative is that now she's thinner and she has become desirable sexually to a coworker who has basically said, hey, some sex. And she has had a negative reaction. So a trauma response to the possibility that someone wants sex with her. And so that part I'm not going to argue with because that's real. She apparently has let them know, I have a history where I was abused sexually by my grandfather as a child. And so that trauma response going, oh no, somebody wants sex with me, connecting that with the negative experiences of sex from childhood, and then reacting to that with binge eating makes complete and total sense to me. 
So this thing is not in question. I think that she was trying to take care of herself. I think everybody is when they have a negative response to an experience. We all find some way to cope, to soothe, to take care of ourselves, to get ourselves back to a feeling of safeness or as close to safety as we can, back to our baseline. And so that's real. But then this also is an interesting thing because it is, like Nancy was saying, playing into the trope that a fat body is an unattractive body. It is an unwanted, unsexual body or desexualized body, I should say. And uh, they continue on that with uh, a little bit later in the chapter. So we're, we're skipping to page 147, where some people are gaining weight as a way to be safe. So there's a quote here, overweight is overlooked, and that's the way I need to be. So essentially, they're saying that, you know, this person is choosing to be fat and uh, using behaviors that create fatness in their body so that they cannot be sexually attractive because they have trauma around sex and sexuality or yeah basically that so so the thing is this really sucks <laughs> this really sucks because the truth is that fat bodies are really sexy there are people who find fat bodies attractive there are people in fat bodies you might be one of them who are out here having sex with some regularity and enjoying a healthy and consent full sex life and i'm excited for you <laughs> this is something that's real right however in the discourse the 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 conditioning that we are that we are given says that this isn't a real thing this is not something that is true nobody wants to do sexy time with you because your body is ugh, so big and this is really untrue because i know that there is also the flip side to this is the over sexualization of the fat body, which is like as a kind of apology for being fat, for having this body that does not conform to what is um, ideal or normative, you must now perform sexy you have to always look sexually attractive you know you have to wear makeup you have to do your hair good you have to dress well you need you need to push your boobs together and put them up underneath your chin you know that kind of stuff you need to be wearing the high heel you need to be like ooh, sex kitten all the time and this is your apology for your fatness and that is a way to buy your acceptance or you know your conditional acceptance in reality but your conditional acceptance into a society that hates fat bodies and so that's the part that for me sometimes is really hard because it's make it make sense on one hand you're telling me that i am completely undesirable as a partner as a parent as as a child-bearing vessel as uh, somebody who you know, put penis in and have a good time because of my fatness. Yet, at the same time, uh, a body like mine is is the number one porn destination for a lot of people. It's real fetish, real, there's real money there. So if you're into sex work, do you. Um, uh, yeah, so, so basically, this is the, the the weird dichotomy of the dehumanization of the fat body right is that you're at both times super sexy and also yuck how can people have sex with you it's just unfair just completely unfair and just really showing how ridiculous the system is is the fact that it's both and in this negative way you know so also in the post here Nancy was talking about the conflation of acts of violence and dominance with desirability. So that's that's what I was talking about when I was saying that hypersexualization or you know hyperpromiscuity being 
always sexually available, regardless if you want it or not, is also part of that performance and price that you're paying for the conditional tolerance and acceptance within normative society. And so, you know, if you have to perform sexy and also perform sex, but if you have to do these things in order to be part of the in crowd, then that is an act of dominance and an act of violence against you. Because you can't just be who you are, you have to create a character and play that role in order to be accepted. And that is violent. So yeah, I I think that these are these are things that are, are really challenging here. And and these are also things that are, you know, just <sighs> it's just really hard to deal with because it's it's your life. You know, if you live in a fat body, this is your life and this is your reality. And this is what is happening to you every day, all day. And it's it's really it's it's a it's a horrible mind fuck because you know, it's you just don't know really where you stand ever. Should I, can I trust someone's, someone's attention and attraction coming my direction? Or are they just fetishizing and dehumanizing me and objectifying me? And, and that makes it very difficult. So, so it's hard. It's hard. But this is also how come fat people are less believable when they're victims of sexual abuse and violence. Just, you know, it's absolutely the whole the fat phobia and and the stigma and the just the the hatred against fat bodies you know basically how is it possible that someone would do that to you you're so gross why would anybody want to do that to you and and that's just so disheartening god there's so much there and it's it just hurts my heart to talk about it so anyway these are a lot of my thoughts on uh, just this part of the book. And, you know, I guess the one thing I have not said yet, I think is, is really important is that trauma is not the reason that every fat body is fat. I think there are people out there where trauma is part of their fat story. And it isn't necessarily. There's a lot of reasons that people are fat and we cannot just, you know, be painted across the board that you are fat because of trauma. Because there are still fat people out here in this world who have had wonderfully loving upbringings. They have, you know, caregivers and social systems that take care of them and they're still fat. So fatness just is. Maybe it's because of trauma. Maybe it's because of binge eating. Maybe it's because you just like food. <laughs> you know, maybe it's it's because of a lot of reasons. There could be medication or disability or you just got a strong gene, you know? I mean, these things are all real and are all true. And there's no reason for us to have to parse why we are fat because that's not really the problem. The fatness is not the problem. The problem is the fact <laughs> that the world hates fatness and treats fat people badly. So regardless of the reason why you are fat and why you're out here, you know, living your best fat life the best you can, doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that you exist and you're important because of that. So I've been Tiana and I hope I've answered your questions. Bye.